Well, uh, looking forward to this evening um, because uh, we I'm very excited to be able to welcome back a returning guest. Um, so Craig Morris, who's been on previously, uh, Canoe Slalom coach, uh, joins me. Craig, welcome back to the Talent Equation. Thank you, Stu. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's great to have you. Um, you know, having recent, relatively recently returned from Tokyo, your first experience out there, and now also currently out in Slovakia, having some interesting adventures, uh, but at the World Championships. So uh, we can go on to that. And also joining us this evening is the intrepid bunch of learners that I refer to lovingly as the Conclave, um, which is the monthly um, community of learning, let's call it, uh, where we've got coaches from different disciplines, different backgrounds all over the world coming together, learning from each other. And this evening we get the opportunity to uh, ask questions of uh, uh, an, an Olympic an Olympic coach. So anyway, let me uh, let me just jump straight in and uh, and just get us started. Craig, what what's been going on? Tell me all about your recent travails and some of the experiences that you had over in Tokyo and all those sorts of things. Uh, I don't even know where to start. So uh, I'm just going to kind of pass the mic over to you and then we can see where where the discussion takes us. Thanks, you. Yeah, Tokyo kind of I feel like I might have set some records in the longest ever debut as a coach um, for <laughs> in terms of when the games actually occurred relative to when they were scheduled. Yeah, so we we selected really early in October 2019, start of October, um, for the original Tokyo Games and those selections then, through some nervy times, ended up holding. Um, and yeah, we obviously got, got out there in the flesh in very different conditions to what we might have expected originally um, in 2021. Yeah, had a few weeks off and now done a World Cup in the interim period in Spain and now we're, we're full gas here in Slovakia for the World Championships. Um, so yeah, I had a little bit of time to reflect on the games and it's um, a privilege to do podcasts like this because I think they help my reflection in themselves. So um, I, I love that, by the way, longest ever debut, yeah, because I didn't think about that, you know, you... You're going out there with a squad. You've, and that's just something I hadn't even thought about as well. You know, you've selected a squad ahead of time. And, of course, you know, other athletes develop and improve and all those sorts of things. And are probably staking a claim to a boat to, 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 take on the, uh, to take on the event. I suppose you probably ought to explain to the audience who may have not heard you speak the first time around about a little bit more about your event so maybe a bit of description of that and then just tell me about how that worked out and, and how you managed it actually because there's probably some interesting ethical dilemmas there I guess. Yeah absolutely yeah it'd be, it'd be interesting to um, unpick some threads there. So yeah I coach Canoe Slalom, been involved in it for far longer than I, I'd like to uh, acknowledge. Um, our event is a, effectively a downriver whitewater event um, kind of akin to downhill slalom, I guess, but on water. Um, it's probably, in most people's opinion, borderlines an extreme sport, but we wouldn't see ourselves in that domain. Um, so yeah, we have to navigate a set course on a particular day. No course is ever the same. So there's no sort of set times or so in even the venues in themselves. As I think we discussed last time, Stu, it's kind of like the modern day canoe slalom course is, is like an artificial channel with kind of Meccano that you can move around on the riverbed to change the flow as, as to how you want and create different features, a bit like a malleable skate park, I guess. Um, so yeah, we like a, our events about 300 meters long, pretty steep gradients um, out there in the elements, um, takes place all around the world. Um, so I kind of often say we're a very bit like skiing, we're a very venue specific sport um, where yes, transfer of skills is critical, um, but also kind of attunement to a particular venue is, is really critical. So our journey to Tokyo in that respect was an in, interesting one. This is a well-funded program. We planned a lot of journeys out there and obviously we're heavily inhibited by COVID as well as the rest of the world on that journey. Um, in terms of, yeah, the games itself, the leading, I, I remember one quote from um, one of the athletes I was fortunate enough to work with um, on the lead-in. So COVID, I think, took, took grip for us in March 2020. We were out on a camp in um, the United Arab Emirates. There's a bizarrely an oasis in the desert out there that we go and train in in the middle of the winter sometimes just to get away from the cold in London. And 
Yeah, the journey from October to then for one of the athletes, he just said, oh, I can't believe how fast this is going. I just want to slow down and, and be at one with it and embrace it. And um, he looks back now going, yeah, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> just fast forward a few months and, you know, their places were were in jeopardy, I guess, or certainly up in, up in limbo and lots of conversations between the International Federation and the British Olympic Association. Um, yeah, you can imagine the psychology meetings, the management meetings, um, as as to what what the stance would be from all parties. Um, and I guess fortunately enough for those guys, but completely understanding of the, the challenges from other competitors that you've discussed. Um, the places were confirmed, and yeah, we we learned that we would get to go, and fingers crossed, we would hope that that the games took place, and and they did. That's in. I mean, again, that is really interesting. You know, you, you, there's a part of me that thinks, what, what did you have to consider when thinking through that issue of do we go with the same athletes? Do we open it up again once training can start? What, 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 what was the discussion? You know, I mean, did, and were you part of that discussion, or is it out of your hands? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So. Current position I sit in the organisation is is have had leadership roles, but I'm currently an Olympic coach. With okay, yes, every role involves a leadership, but I don't have line management as such. Um, so I guess I was informed as to how the discussions would play out, and probably trying to get clarity on behalf of the athletes as to what the process would be, which was you know a difficult challenge because people have never prepared for you know. A force majeure like this, I guess, in many ways. Um, so everyone was finding the feet. So whilst whilst being mindful and understanding of that with others within the stakeholder team, I was obviously looking to represent the athletes as clearly and, and as fairly as possible with compassion. Um, but also, I think, as, as many people on the call and listening will know, um, I'm not just a personal coach. I'm a member of a British canoeing team. Um, which spans broader than my duties as a, as a personal coach. You know, I'm definitely a team coach before I'm a personal coach, and therefore you have to be understanding of, of the relationships and the motivations and intentions of others uh, and try and act with integrity throughout. So I think it was quite a difficult time, and, and as with many sports, you know, that was a time when we're all learning to communicate as we are tonight over online platforms. Um, and for me personally, I've been fortunate enough to work with two of the athletes that I supported at the games for over 10 years. So that face-to-face -face interaction is, is really a critical part of reading and, and, and the giving and receiving of offers as, as in our discourse. So yeah, it was a particular challenge, I think. Um, and I, I mean, obviously I look at this with a bit of an ecological lens, I suppose. And you mentioned a minute ago that part of the planning was to make several trips to the course, I suppose, to, orientate to acclimatize begin to learn something of the way the course could could potentially be set up and all these different things and obviously you're robbed of that now knowing that you know you would have wanted to have a very experiential approach to that how did you adapt well we're fortunate and we have a, an amazing playground um, in london <laughs> that i've talked about previously so a lot of the modern designs in slalom are kind of taking shape around a template now okay. um, that is both environmentally and financially sustainable. Um, I guess we chose to take over time, and obviously it's an individual's um, prerogative to take their own stance on things, but we chose to take a view that if we couldn't be there, then we believe we've got the best, best venue in the world to prepare on. And we're fortunate enough to have skillful practitioners to hand that can help shape the design of, of the channel um, to mirror that of what, what we had experienced in Tokyo, because we did manage to get out there twice at the back end of 2019, which was a positive of selecting early. We could go out there and, and spend time there. Um, and yeah, I mean, any little advantages, do you laugh at this? So um, I had a guy who I won't name him, but there's a guy who works for one of the national national institutes who went out to Tokyo and there's, a, there's actually a large ferris wheel opposite that stands above the venue in Kaso Rinkai um, and I got in to take photos of the riverbed on a long zoom camera so we could look at the block configuration to see if there'd been any changes after we'd left um, as COVID took shape. So little things like that and yeah in terms of 
of mirroring conditions and things like that. We access, fortunate enough to access the heat chamber through the English Institute of Sport, try and look at some perceptual um, skill tasks, um, communicative relational tasks between coach and athlete under extreme humidity, which um, I don't know if anyone's experienced Tokyo in summer, but yeah, it wasn't as bad as it could be out there, but it was pretty, pretty full on at times for sure. So definitely glad we had some exposure to the reality of that situation. Um, so we're looking to, and, and there's probably loads of other little threads that, um, to go into, but we looked for, I guess, anything that we thought would attune us um, in simulation. Uh, we've talked about that before. So we worked pretty hard on what, what I call simulation training um, to try and simulate the conditions of the environment or the self-selected challenges that people might have to versions of best self, be that in preparation or in delivery of the event. I'm um, intrigued by that notion, actually, um, of kind of simulation training. So I kind of feel free to expand on that without giving away any like, you know, trade secrets, because, of course, this might be listened <laughs> to by other canoe coaches across the world. But what, what sort of things do you kind of bring to bear in that kind of scenario? I think the first thing to say is it's really collaborative. Mm. Um, certainly evolved to that over time as I've kind of repositioned or can reconceptualize coaching. Um, so it's generally a triangle between myself, the psychologist, and the athlete in terms of the way we did it for Tokyo. Um, well, there's a few different things that I'll chat through here. And yeah, just, just interrupt if you want to pull on any threads particularly. So we actually used a constraints approach to look at simulation training. Um, so the athletes do a lot of work on something called the super strength model in psychology, which is the work of Kate Ludlam, um, which is facilitated by a psychologist down in, in canoeing, Danielle Adams. Um, and so I guess within that, I won't go into detail on that, but it establishes best, best versions of self and the calibration against that in and the transfer of that to different environments. Uh, and within that, I guess we work really closely with the time we were given over COVID um, to look at what elements of the exposure to the environment of competition could challenge that, could disrupt that, could provide hurdles or throw people off that to a point where as we talk on the curve of super strengths, it would either lead it to be underdone, overdone or reckless or anywhere on that continuum. Uh, and they're looking to operate in optimal or wriggle room generally. Um, so we took your yeah, individual task environment um, as the three headers really and ha helped frame that. And obviously it was quite a, an informative process for us together to look at, you know, I'm a big advocate of athletes understanding the why of their practice and the how of their practice rather than it just being the, the domain of coaches or, or those working in, in academia and pedagogy. So it was a really good shared project in that respect as well. So, you know, that could be anything from a particular athlete flagging that they're really distracted, say, socially um, during the preparation phase on the mountain. So for the listeners, we, we don't get to practice on the course. Once the course is hung on the river, we only get to view it from the river bank. So we're in a very different perspective to that of in the boat. Yes, we get to watch some people um, do demonstration runs on it, but that's all we have. So from elements such as, yeah, um, particular skill sequences that might, you know, draw too much attention to a particular area of the course on race day. It could be commentary. It could be the conditions um, for some. It could be not feeling great in the warm-up. Um, so, yeah, we, I guess the athletes effectively gave permissions um, for a menu of, of manipulation, I suppose, or a menu of dial up, dial down in, in the categories under the constraints model by Newell. Um, and then, yeah, it sounds a bit of a power trip, but I guess we, the staffing team, were given permission to really play with those a little bit. Um, important to say that those periods of time were labeled. And I guess this simulation training can be pretty intense. Um, so a lot of it was done. We created series of competitions in London because um, the main issue, I guess, was that the guys hadn't competed for pretty much 18 months going into the games, um, certainly into one competition before the game. So 
we had to simulate that race experience in London as much as possible. And we would use the manipulation of constraints from these permission sort of set up meetings um, to really dial stuff up. And then we'd have a really good padded collaborative review process, plan do review around that. Um, and then, yeah, see where that went in the future. And, you know, some of those cropped up at the games, which is cool. Of course, you're not preparing for reality because every context is very unique. Um, it's almost how, you, how you're able to recalibrate your attention or guide your attention around challenges to that by different, differing information sources and that you've become more comfortable in getting back to, to know what, what works for you in terms of where you place your attention on competition day. Uh, so much, so much to dig into. Um, I love this idea, by the way. So you sought, and this is quite a fundamental point, you sought permission from the athletes to create, and I love this phrase, a menu of manipulations. So, so I'm assuming you didn't always, or you didn't always tell them what was coming there was an element of surprise to this because that's part of the adaptation isn't it but you had to get permission that you were going to did so did they agree ahead of time to what the manipulations would be or did they just trust that you would put them in place in such a way that was designed to create a sort of an optimal level of either stress or arousal or whatever it might be and sort of trust in you that you would do that? Or did they know the kind of thing that was likely to come but just didn't know when it was going to come? Yeah, probably a blend, Stu. So there, was, there would be some key themes under each of, of the constraint headings, I guess. Um, and traditionally, we would ask for examples of what that would look like in, a, in an instance or an event or an action. Um, so... You know, that might be, um, it might be well like commentary that tells me I'm way down on the first split or something like that, you know, or a theme around commentary distraction, distraction from external sources. So that gives us, I guess, a window to, you know, we sometimes we bring schools in to watch the session and maybe we brief that, maybe we don't, um, or friends and family will come down or the performance director will drop in. Um, you know, all these sort of socio, psychological, cultural constraints that can have an influence on any one person's um, skill on the day um, could all be played with. So yes and no. Um, I think with the intensity we were looking to provoke for this simulation that was trying to mirror, obviously, um, the biggest show on earth, as some people might call it. Um, I think we were really clear on labelling a period of time like a live period of time. So it could happen anywhere between this date and that date, maybe three to four weeks. There were key delivery focus sessions that were labeled in that block to, to rouse, I guess, adrenaline and anxiety potentially. Um, some of the athletes had um, designed their own sort of, um, I guess, reward and threat kind of conditions based on those, those identified simulations. Um, whether that be um, how they would have to perform in order to progress to the following day, which is normal of competition, but very difficult to um, monitor in training when you've only got a very small group due to COVID regs, uh, little things like that. Um, and what we did do is a psychologist and I would always touch base as we do a race with the athletes the night before and then the morning of. And we'd always, and I think this is important when, when working in more of a developing setting, certainly, is we'd always sense the mood. Um, you know, Rusty always says, uh, always get a handle on which bus stop they've arrived from today. They all arrive at the same one, but which one did they get on in the morning? You know, what's gone on for them? Um, and then because we'd got all these permissions and we were working towards such a, an event with the gravity of the games, sometimes we'd take heed of those. And, and shift where we'd go on the menu. But sometimes we'd hold pretty firm and we knew we'd be in for a noisy day um, because, you know, you can't, you can't decide how you're going to wake up on the morning of the Olympic Games necessarily. So, uh, yeah, a blend of the two, I think. But um, surprise is important. But what I've learned over time is that if they own the decision to enter into the intensity of training such a simulation, 
then actually the response and the buy-in and the real kind of profound nature of reflection is, is much, much more heightened and much more powerful for a dynamic of relationship than it is if the power sits with a practitioner, be that a coach or a psychologist. Um, uh, so did you also, did you, was it say like implemented, because you've got a group, a training group, or are you working individually in this context? Um, I do have a, I mean, it's an individual sport, yeah. um, certainly in the Olympic program anyway. Um, and, but I do have a group of three athletes that, that compete over, well, seven, six disciplines now, but in terms of the Olympic program, it's three. Um, so yeah, kind of on those simulation days, I would be working one to three as a coach. One to three. And would you apply a manipulation across all three at the same time, or would it be individualized based on their super strength profile? Yeah, it was very individualized through that, through that period. Um, based on the permissions they're given. And I guess the, you know, psychologists might call it, um, uh, what would they call it? Case profiling, I suppose, in terms of around this stuff, like what triggers, what buttons to press almost to provoke distraction, provoke things that might throw, throw best version of self off on the day. Um, to the point where we had pre-recorded, I'd got a pre-recorded reel, for example, of commentary and I'd requested that the athletes bring waterproof audio devices that they could listen to in the warm-up. And some of the commentary, which is actually of a, um, was provided for me kindly by one of the commentators internationally, so it's familiar for them. Um, so it brought out that reality or authenticity of race day and would push the buttons before they went, you know, like maybe upping the stakes of what they needed to do based on who'd gone before. And that might be, you know, people sometimes have preferences of where they, if they could fantasy choose where they went off in a final, you know, first or last, um, it would provoke some emotions around that or be designed to do so. Yeah, yeah so I very, very individual. I mean, if obviously, if we get a school in, um, you could say it's a blanket, a blanket manipulation. However, how people respond to that is extremely individual, as you know, some people will absolutely love it. Some people will freak out because they didn't know that they were coming and some people will be anywhere in between. Um, and from the perspective of uh, kind of representativeness, in, in every case, it's sort of a, a competitive or a semi-competitive experience with the three athletes? Um, it was, yes. Not necessarily between them, just because okay. of the disciplines they do. Um, right. The, the girls that I support do actually compete against each other, but they weren't selected to do so in the Olympic program. Okay. Um, when we were at home doing this during COVID, it's a bit of a challenge of an individual sport sometimes. So we're an elite performance center, fortunate enough to have um, dispensation during certain times of COVID to still train, but obviously on highly limited numbers. Therefore, the pool of depth of athlete level was quite small in terms of being able to create competitive environment that was representative of an international race like we, we weren't able to get close to that in many ways so what we had to do and the athletes pretty much led on the design of this was we would use performance analysis data taken over competition for x amount of years or um, in their class to kind of have some markers um, of reference that they had to hit relative to their peers or relative to their cross-class peers in, in different disciplines. So we tried to, yeah, you're not, it's not representative, but you're trying to artificially dial that up as much as possible. Um, and again, the importance of them driving that is that it's real for them rather than a figure that you pluck out that, yeah, they might not, but maybe the buy-in isn't enough to provoke anxiety or, or real adrenaline towards it. It's almost like a, almost like a handicapping type scheme like you would in golf where, it's it's different. We're different. We're sort of slightly different levels, but we can still compete against each other because we've designed it in such a way. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, that would make sense. Okay, interesting. And you also very kind of casually just dropped in earlier on that some of the manipulations appeared during the games. So I'd be interested to hear more about that. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm trying to think now. Um, trying to think. Put me on the spot. So. 
variations around the theme for sure. Um, like challenges of, of forgetting equipment maybe um, on a race day when that had been challenged, you know, flagged as an organization sort of um, potential sort of area of theme that could throw some, some certain individuals off. Um, I think the, the absence of crowds was a really interesting one in the end. Right. Um, we, we'd kind of artificially trained for crowds in many ways, but actually the natural situation that we've been training under on COVID, like bar maybe 100 photographers, kind of played out. Um, so that was interesting in itself. Um, some of the passages through the rounds would have replicated some of the manipulations, I think, that we, we were able to put in place and challenge um, on the day. Um, and definitely um, some of the commentary type stuff, because there was no crowd, was extremely loud um, and, and in English. So, yeah, very much being able to be heard, I think. Um, yeah, without having a little bit more time to think, I can't pinpoint any more specific ones, but no doubt around themes, themes of disruption, I guess, rupture and repair, as I've heard it called before, of how people are able to recalibrate their attempt. First notice, I guess, be aware of where their attention is, um, accept where it is, and then place it in a way that they know works for them nine times out of 10. I think there was plenty that came up that would need to recalibrate, both for athletes and as coaches, I think, during those games. So so a lot of this, so it sounds to me that you know, your psychologist is obviously very central to this because a lot of it is around them having a heightened understanding of where their attention is and where it might be taking them away from them being in an optimal state to be able to perform all those sorts of things so a lot it's, it strikes me that and this is where I think it's quite interesting sometimes in sport how people lose sight of this and obviously you've got a psychologist you work with but for a lot of the coaches on the call tonight but a lot of the coaches out there in a community setting they don't have that benefit but yet they still have to consider this because one of the learnings that you can provide for us I think tonight is that this idea of um, manipulations and destabilizations, particularly in preparation for a major activity, and and as part of the learning process, you're designing situations that will destabilize an individual's focus, and so they lose they lose uh, they lose intention, clarity of intention, clarity of attention on the things that are going to give them the most, best opportunity for to perform as, as well as they possibly can. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in there that, you know, yes, having a psychologist is really helpful because they have a different level of training and understanding around athlete and they can really understand levels of athlete arise, arousal that we may not. But the design of experiences that can challenge those things is within everybody's grasp. So there's, there's a lot in there that's really quite exciting, I think, and quite interesting to pull on. Yeah, absolutely. And. I think we've made some excellent mistakes to get to those stages. Um, <laughs> might not have viewed them as excellent at the time. Um, <laughs> certainly not when emotions coming at you at 100 mile an hour from others. But um, one such example is, I think you're right. When I, If I try and boil that down, it's like when we talk about, so to our psychologist works, like you probably heard me almost quote it there, it's like a, a, an aware, accept, reset type framework. Um, and, you know, for me, I kind of, obviously look through an ecological lens on that. Um, and it's really interesting. So a, a little while back, we were looking to improve consistency with a particular athlete um, as a collective project. And, and where we got drawn into is, is quite far from where we've gone now, but we got drawn into um, thinking that it was a good idea to get that athlete to be able to articulate their plan or their planned intention, their planned route down the course before they went and then kind of check sheet score it after they'd finished. Um, we thought that was a good way of kind of trying to narrow attention into, um, into the key information um, to perform for action. Um, we got about halfway a season through that, half season through that. Um, and 
this athlete quite rightly tore her head off and just said, I feel like a robot. I'm just evaluating against something that I've predetermined and I'm not free. And those were the words that really stuck with me. Um, and I say it was an excellent mistake because it definitely guided me to, I guess I, I always think about it. It's a bit like, you know, if you say Wayne Rooney's kind of a street soccer kind of guy, it was like, or Stuart Broad, when someone tried to change his action for the, uh, the cricket coach amongst us here, it's like, yeah, we were trying to change someone's authenticity of performance um, to fit into something that we were, you know, suggesting was a predetermined model of excellence. Um, and it spat us back in the face really hard. Um, we'd gone there together, so we were able to survive it, I think. But where we went from there was really about, yeah, just kind of highest order. So the biggest change from that on course in terms of guiding attention is we, we shifted from from rules, i.e. I need to have my stroke here, my bow there, um, needs to be angled here, um, to principles, like highest or higher order principles of movement, effectively. Where am I looking? Where am I? What space am I moving into? Um, and then trusting adaptability, well, recognizing that adaptability um, in the moment and instinct is, is you know, is skill in itself and and their strengths within that um, and kind of really freeing them up and that's been a really really wonderful journey i think um and it's still one that we're kind of weaving our way through because what i found as i've spoke about before to you is, is what i found that it's all about trying to keep information attention on information that's specifying for action for what you're doing or the future now kind of that sense of perspective control and I think when plans are too tight or too narrow, what, what I've personally found in coaching, and I'm not suggesting it's the same for everybody in, in any sport, is that the temptation to evaluate against a predetermined route is so rich and such a deep source of information, um, but it isn't specifying for action because you're not able to free your cognition up to place attention in the key areas um, that are required to kind of see the opportunities in front of you. Um, deliberately trying not to use too much jargon here um, although I know we're in good company for jargon so well yeah but I, I would I was going to get you to unpack that a little bit because um, for somebody who's not necessarily familiar with the concept of specifying information and keeping attention there um, uh, particularly around the concept of adaptability I can totally understand why almost creating a predetermined notion of what should happen in a performance context which is I think will resonate with a lot of people that's essentially desensitizing and that's essentially what the athlete was saying is that right that you're essentially desensitizing me from the things that help me perform best i.e being attuned to the the relevant sources of information you know and in, in all their forms visual and haptic and yeah. uh you know and, and kind of through i guess what they can taste touch hear, all those sorts of different contexts um so i imagine is that that's is, have i got that right is that essentially what the athlete was saying in obviously not as many words but broadly speaking you know you're basically taking me away from the stuff that's giving me the the the, the route to perform best no absolutely i think they would articulate it that they were no longer in the present. They were no longer at one with what they were doing. They were living something. They were living a vision or a voice that wasn't what was in front of them. Um, and therefore, they were constantly calibrating almost against this DVD, I guess, running in their head of, of what it should look like or what I've told, told them it, it should look like. Um, and they found, I guess, not only did they find that very noisy, and very combative it wasn't very enjoyable <laughs> you could see it it was like yeah i mean it was mechanical but it, you could just see it just wasn't enjoyable and like even if they performed quite well in terms of outcome it just wasn't yeah there wasn't that sense of like just just living it like i said earlier we're on the on the edge of an extreme sport and there's that element of exhilaration that we are definitely roboticized in that process and so you just sort of touched on the edge of this. I just want to explore it a little bit more. It's just an area of particular interest. 
So you, you've had this from coming back from the athlete and what your athlete is essentially saying to you is, look, you know, you're taking me out of flow. You know, when you use the term no longer at one with the activity. So, you know, that for me is almost words that speak towards the idea of the athlete attempting to being to being in flow. And so this external architecture, you know, that's been wrapped around the activity, you know, and their their attempts to live up to this means that they're, I guess, almost continuously measuring themselves against this ideal and knowing that they're not they're not matching it, which I can totally understand would be hugely frustrating and definitely taking away from this concept of just being in the space and just a heightened awareness that most of us have maybe experienced fleetingly, um, but obviously is an intrinsic part of, uh, you know, kind of white, a whitewater competitor's reason for being, I guess. So I can sort of understand why there's almost like a double whammy there, it seems to me, whereby they're essentially saying, not only am I, you know, like say, not able to compete my best, but I'm actually not able to, ha I'm not able to have the experience that I even got into this whole gig in the first place for. Is that, is that a broad way of saying what they're kind of saying to you? No, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. We were, yeah, desensitizing is a good word. I guess taking away some of the richness of, of the doing. Um, as you say, you know, I think there was a sense that they knew they would need to articulate what they were doing afterwards as well. I mean, who would ever put an athlete in a position <laughs> that they knew they would have to do that while they were doing it? Well, I did. Um, so I think there's an element of that, really. And, and you know, we talk in very different terms now. Like this, And there were some flags in training, had I been astute enough to pick up on them. Um, and we have some really rich discussions around that, you know, and one of them in canoeing terms and Marianne might resonate with this is, is that sense of, I knew that was going to happen, but I couldn't do anything about it. And I'm looking and I'm going, well, you were five meters away from the pivotal moment of action control. I'm kind of seeing opportunities to do something about that. Um, but because the attention is placed on the evaluation that said, I need to be on a left plate. It's a bit like I always kind of, up with these weird analogies in canoeing and one of them is like a long jumper stuttering onto the board and it, it can get a bit like that when you're trying to jump over a big feature or a big drop or or, or anything like that in canoeing and, and people who get kind of really tied to a particular sequence of movement pattern i.e i'm going to jump off that left and it may well be that jumping off that left experience over time tells us that it might afford you more speed on the back of the feature but for those who are really attached to that, rather than maybe dry and move left, um, when they, something happens, as of course it can in this sort of dynamic environment, that means they're no longer on the left. They're thinking that they're no longer on the left, rather than of the opportunities that still remain in the environment to move to the left and stay dry. And, and there were flags like that, so that kind of changed how we'd shape language in particular it's the biggest shift i've had in, in my journey towards a more ecological approach has been has been the use of language um, as well as constraints i think i think i think everybody uses constraints um, when you start understanding motor learning and, and get to grips and get more confident with with how you can use them as a collaborative and co-creation i think um, you start to use them more wisely though, and you start to understand them and you're conscious of some of the sacrifices of representative work. How, um, when you say you're ch changing the use of language, how has, the lang how has your language changed? Um, it's a lot more, it's a lot more about understanding than it is, and, and not a say, I mean, sense of kind of knowing as we go if we're going to get into like wayfinding and things like that rather than being able to package knowledge yeah in a moment and yeah. sell it to an annual review that we've got in two weeks time and say like i'm great at co i'm great at coaching because my athlete can tell you how to do a technical skill on the water um, and how much they've learned about where they place the blade um it's more about showing i guess more about the living of it the dynamic of it um 
So yeah, in creating invitations in discourse rather than coming from a stance of knowing um, or a stance of ego, I think, where there is a final point. Try to leave a lot of interactions actually as a as a thread of direction, um, something that we're sniffing at or interested in. Um, but there's never a black and white that we know that that is the ultimate answer. And it's just information for next time. So that's interesting. So it's not necessarily about the words used. It's more about how they're used. I think so. So it would be a lot more about, you know, I mean, it's classic around open questions and things like that, but it's a lot more specific around that, um, I guess, depending on who I who I'm interacting with, because that's the sense it has to be authentic to the individual. I can't just come out with generic phrases. So, you know, a lot more around show me or tell me. Um, I'm less, I used to, I used to definitely mine for someone to be able to tell me how they'd done something. Like it really frustrated me as a coach. Didn't think I was competent in my job if someone couldn't explain to me how they just absolutely smoked a really complex sequence on a big feature. Um, now I'm like discouraging of their journey to try and be able to articulate it. <laughs> like you don't need to, it's fine, let's go. Um, so full circle on that stuff, I guess, and a lot, trying to get people a lot more trusting in their adaptability, a lot more trusting in having open attention in the moment to, um, to be dynamic in how they're able to execute skills. And I think what it has done is it's, it's afforded, I guess, um, more movement solutions um, to the same tasks. Um, they're open a lot longer than they used to be. I talked about that five meter distance now. I think variable movement solutions are now open for a lot longer. I won't go into the technical phrases around that, but um, that's been definitely a richness that I've seen. Um, and people will say that they're able to adapt. You know, I, I, a few years ago, Rusty said to me, um, we said to an athlete I was working with at the time, it was a pivotal moment in my coaching, was um, what, is it, what is it that defines the best people in the world at your sport? Is it their ability to execute the plan they construct off the bank? Or is it how they adapt in the performance itself? And over a period of about six months, that, that pretty much derailed my entire pedagogical approach to coaching. <laughs> Can you slot? Rusty will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. <laughs> I can just imagine the process. Yeah. yeah. You know how it goes. Here was me presented at a conference, almost suited and booted. He rocks up in his shorts and a beanie hat and unpicks me. Yeah. <laughs> I love in, it. The, in the nicest possible way. Mm. <laughs> Makes me love him at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in the interest of creating invitations in discourse, I'm, I will open up some of the questions to the group. But before we jump before we jump into that one of the things that you, you mentioned earlier about is which i really like the idea of this idea of making excellent mistakes and i was thinking when you said that that actually so much of the coaching journey is just a, a series making a series of excellent mistakes and and then those mistakes being you know kind of valuable in some way um when you're at the games itself what what excellent mistakes did you make? <laughs> or, or, okay, that's probably unfair. You might not have, but what stands out to you as kind of key pivotal moments of, of learning and things that you're going to take away and, and things that other coaches listening to this might, might find either valuable or interesting? Yeah. Good and bad. Fascinating. Um... Yeah, I'll just, I'll just freestyle this a little bit. I mean, one of my most profound experiences of the games, and it transcends both myself and the athlete experience, I think, and it's probably somewhat a COVID-specific one, was the transitions were really harsh, and we knew they would be. So we were away for a month in total. Um, there's two weeks in a canoe slalom quarantine bubble um, in a Disney hotel there on Tokyo Bay. So single room, very nice hotel, lovely overlooking a beautiful running track down the coast that we weren't allowed to use. Um, and basically a hotel course, hotel course. Meals to the, to the room for the first few days and then within the bubble thereafter. 
So all the time to all the time in the world, but no one to share it with, and nothing to do with it. Um, then we moved into the village for the final two weeks. Um, and suddenly I'm in a room with six male colleagues, including athletes, um, in what can only be described as probably a large PO ferries cabin. Um, you know, and like we're right across performance director through to athletes, through coaches, all in all in one room. So suddenly you're thrown into a really tight space with a lot of people with no real escape. Um, so some of those transitions were very interesting. And I think we worked really closely to kind of map out how each other were transcending those. So it's not a particular skill on that, but I guess it's the social element is so particular, you know, the old key phrase that a happy athlete is a good one, but it's the same for any person, did, isn't it? I think. Did you have any inkling that that was going to be the case? Um, yes, to a degree. I don't think we knew the layout of the land in the village until we arrived in terms of numbers. And I think we all cope pretty well with that. Um, you know, but there's different dynamics within that. So the male cabin was all canoe slalom. The females on our team were rotating, sharing with different sports. So as much as you try to control your own environment, that there's people from different sports come in with their own sort of cultural and social norms. Um, so that was really interesting and and kind of mapping out people's experience of their first games within that was a real kind of touch point um, to, to work through. Um, other pivotal moments, I mean, one, one of the athletes um, didn't have uh, the performance they would have liked in the final. Um, there's a lot of media around this um, and was in, yeah, quite an emotional state of the finish line and I was walking down towards them and um, the two other members of our, our group, one who had had raced and finished fourth, was really handling his own frustration from the previous day. Um, and another athlete who was yet to race, like just a pivotal moment as I walked down there, kind of gathering my thoughts of how to support in what was a media cauldron, um, knowing that she was yeah pretty broken, broken down emotionally at that point. Like the athletes were, were, were right there for her. Um, and I know subsequent reflections around that was even in the face of adversity and mass disappointment, um, that was a real rich moment for that particular individual um, of coming together of feeling supported by her fellow teammates who she competes against as well sometimes. Um, so that was one highlight um, as well, really. But I think the way they all embraced the journey, like they all stretched themselves massively in terms of um, wanting to really grow and be really attuned to the experience itself. Like we were really clear that despite them having expectations of what an Olympic Games would look, sound and feel like, and that this would be very different, we were kind of all bought in to make this would be our games. And, and it was up to us to dictate our experience and the memories of our own games. So even, you know, fortunate enough that one of the athletes won a medal that was an incredible experience to be part of um, and the memories around that but on an equal level with the memories around some of the more adverse experiences um, along the way because I think what we managed to do is remain really tight as a team um, and really supportive of each other. Brilliant I mean that's really fascinating um, in, in itself that kind of insight to you know this is the stuff you never see of course you know you never hear these kinds of stories and you don't ever get that perspective and they don't in my opinion spend enough time I think talking to the coaches uh, and and understanding more about their experiences and their journeys because obviously they're always interested in the athletes and all those sorts of things which is great but there's that other part of me that always thinks you know you would get such a rich perspective if you also spoke to some of the coaches about what was going on and all that sort of stuff so Really appreciate you sharing some of that. Um, <clears throat> right then, now's the moment of truth, Craig, because uh, the group Face are going to the group are going to come in with uh, with some conversation, uh, some some questions, and uh, I can see the chat started to. Uh, uh, Marianne saying the picture of them supporting was her favourite picture of the Olympics, which is uh, which is nice to hear. So um, let me open the uh, let me open the the gallery up and. Uh, everybody feel free to come in, hands up. Mark's already come off mic. He's ready to go. I knew he, I knew he wouldn't let me down. Mark, jump on in there and, uh, and ask away. Uh, when I worked with the England Junior Hockey Programme, 
I often thought we we quite when we went away we actually had quite often pretty good hotel facilities and what have you. And it's just interesting that when you're talking about the accommodation, would that um and I often thought we we are we ended up with better accommodation than they ever had when they went to Olympic Games. I remember the setup in Beijing in the village for the hockey players. Would you therefore build that into trade you know training or if you when you go abroad would it be worth manipulating that if you like so purposely um you know booking uh, substandard accommodation or whatever <laughs> to to put them in those situations because all that stuff seems to me far more important than the tactic te technical tactic all the rest of it those things that throw people off mm. that's a great question mark and i think considering the whole holistic environment is super important. Um, yeah, it's one thing I've been reflecting on because we spent a lot of time deliberately as a tight Olympic team. This is quite unusual. We go, we go from like maybe a staffing an athlete team of about 20 in a normal kind of world championships like here down to about nine. Um, so that can change the dynamic. It can, it can be a bit different, maybe quite intense. But what we hadn't really had the opportunity to do because of protecting athlete health and under COVID regs is live in each other's pockets. Um, so it's a really interesting thing. Like um, we were thrown into an environment where suddenly um, you were being asked to do that. And I think, yeah, maybe for some, it, it was, it took longer to calibrate to that than others. Um, fortunate enough to have great relationships that we can discuss that stuff together. Um, but yeah, we, um, we definitely have quite plush accommodation. The one I'm in now is, is very nice, um, the Olympic Center here in Slovakia. But I would agree with that. I think it's interesting to see how people respond. I mean, yeah, that's a manipulation in itself, isn't it? See how they respond together and how they work together, particularly in a team sport, to, to notice things about each other and support and challenge each other in a constructive manner on those sort of things. Yeah. I have to say that's it's not something I necessarily would have thought about uh, beforehand, but actually now you do think about now I think do think about it. It's like again, I don't know how I would navigate the ethical dimensions of this because in a learning space where you want optimal opportunities for people to learn at the same time, you also might want to destabilize sleep, for example, or, and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, really interesting. Uh, Robert, come on in. Right, that was great. Um, just your definition then of what makes the best athlete, is it someone who has a plan and executes it or is it someone who can adapt? I just wondered then in relation to like how big a factor is just luck in the sport? Like if someone went down slalom 10 times, like what range of times would they have? Or I know in sailing, for example, in sailing, if the wind isn't blowing in your particular time, hard luck. <laughs> yeah no it's a great question um ah uh, less so i think you know if you map out over time the the best athletes are there or thereabouts most weeks um if not every week um you know there's certain individuals in our sport that have kind of ripped up the rule book that says oh it's a really inconsistent sport you can't win every week you need to learn to lose well there's one particular female athlete who went a whole season undefeated for example a couple of years back so um, I mean, for sure, the water is extremely changeable. I guess it's how you respond to that, whether you feel that, um, you know, whether there's an element of justice in your head, which I would say is an evaluation, rather than, you know, dealing with what's in front of you and making the most of the opportunity. I think the best boats in the world, obviously, they're extremely skillful and they carry through some knowledge about or knowledge of previous performance. We would be naive not to put that into the mix. Um, but they're definitely calibrating around the here and now um, better than certain people who are, are maybe a little bit too attached to a particular um, way of doing. And obviously, you know, we shouldn't be naive to the confidence that comes with progression or winning over time. And I mean winning whatever winning may be for you at that level, um, because it's easier to place attention in front of you in the face of adversity if you've had previous success and you know you're quick 
and you know you can make mistakes and still be quick and things like that but I guess the challenge for us in developing athletes is is trying to instill that within them whilst this progress is happening and not wait for the progress before it's too late sometimes thanks interesting question in the chat uh Craig Marianne are you able to come off mic and ask it yeah, sure. Hi, and thank you both. That was that was so interesting to listen to, as always. Um, yeah, probably no surprise, Craig. I where, where I go is like you know that's solving those representation hungry um, problems of how do we you know sort of warming up. I know it's something that we sort of there was a bit of a chat on Twitter about, and, and not just being physiological, <laughs> but how do we warm up also for that perceptual attunement, the decision making, etc. And how does that then also um, sort of link to the fact that in your sport, like many others, including things like show jumping, you have to learn the course from the bank. And, and how, you know, how do you do that from an ecological perspective where you maybe try and avoid the idea of creating a representation through mental rehearsal to learn um, that, that course? So, yeah, kind of wrapping those two up, really. Yeah, so, sure. <laughs> uh, and this is an ongoing exploration of yeah, many people, including Marianne, myself, Ludovic. Um, well, if anyone's ever been to a canoe slalom event, you'll you'll have laughed your head off because what, what you see, and I'll I'll encounter it tomorrow morning when I go down, is you see um, very very athletic people closing their eyes, doing quite a balletic dance on the riverbank, um, moving their arms around um, quite beautifully, like they're in Swan Lake. Um, so a lot of people do visualize and and move in standing position, which is interesting because obviously they don't paddle in standing position. Um, but in terms of, I guess, what we've, I can only speak for what we do, Marianne, and obviously where I've come from and an awareness of what others may do. And I think there's a real spectrum of how people, you know, I still see, um, and there's cultural differences in that. I, I will see this weekend coaches talking athletes through a plan down the course. Um, I have seen um, coaches kind of recap that in rehearsal before as well and talk athletes through the plan while the, the athletes closing their eyes I assume visualizing that um, I guess what we do is we kind of we plan backwards is it's been quite an evolving thing so um, I still yet to see anyone walk the course from the finish up but the day I do it'll be a really intriguing conversation to unpick um, but we plan sequences backwards from kind of like what would you like to see when you arrive here um, to be able to move? So I heard a phrase like time architect a long time ago, um, like creating space within the run, both psychologically and physically, to be able to see more opportunities for action uh, and to be free to execute them. Um, so we talk a lot about moving into space where the eyes are looking, the principles of movement. Um, but it's all about guiding attention. So the planning phase for us would be guiding attention around what we might conventionally know about a particular skill sequence on the course. Um, so we won't have covered everything this week, certainly not with one of the athletes who's had whiplash with me. Um, but there are some conventional information sources. And by that, I mean, kind of our best experience will tell us that these things these movements or these opportunities for action exist if we're able to pick up on, on them and execute them. Um, so generally it's that, Marianne. And I think like, so I know one athlete I worked with the weekend, we had a, a psych meeting today. I won't go into too much detail, but um, one of their measures of success will be that they don't become too attached to particular technical cues within the plan. Um, it's more sort of um, visual perceptual cues that they're using. Um, to pick up on the invitations to move into space. Um, so, yeah, we've kind of moved, but what you still will get, and I've been there, is that athletes and coaches will still say that if you execute 95% of your plan, then that's success. Um, well, I was always uncomfortable with that because I was like, well, what if the 5% is, the, is worth 15 seconds? <laughs> you know where's that five percent is is like you know it can be the penalty that was missed the other night that was probably 0.1 percent of that game um but it's pivotal so i was always a bit uncomfortable with that and i never quite knew how you would 
um, evaluate against a plan. And when we went there, we found out that it wasn't a very nice place to be with a particular thing. I'm interested in two things. I'm interested in two things you've said there, Craig. If I'm, if I can, just sort of pick on a couple of threads a little bit. Um, the first one was, you said that people stand whilst going through this, essentially, you know, kind of visualization or mental rehearsal. Why don't they sit? Why don't they sit in a boat? I, I, I don't know. It's, is that one of those obvious questions that like? <laughs> You're now going to go. You know what? That might be a good idea, or is it like there's a reason why? <laughs> no, I'd say they do it as well. Okay. Um, so they will. Then you will see people like you know, eyes closed or eyes open. So generally, we warm up in quite um, a really dialed down environment in terms of representing what they're about to do. So quite often it's flat water. Quite often there's no gates. Um, so it can be quite a challenge, as Marianne's talked about, and. A challenge for us is, is to get the exposure to decision making into the war is a real rich challenge for us um, and to get the kind of invasion on the senses of, of information um, to pick up on the key ones for action because it's quite a contained environment really for us mm. um, I'm trying to compare it it's a bit like maybe well I wouldn't even know how to compare it um, it's just a completely different event quite often that they're warming up for um, which is, is, there a bit any, of a is there anything that could be done with um, going forward, for example, you know, with the with the increased sort of availability of things like VR? I'm thinking of the work that um, I think it's Kathy Craig over in Northern Ireland is doing with um, goalkeepers and uh, giving them uh vr as a means by which to for example practice things like free kicks where they're often yeah. you know they have occluded vision and things like that is there scope for that going forward i mean i don't think it anyway be as representative but you mentioned this sort of assault on the senses mm. as, as at least okay yes you might be in a very passive space but at least you've got something that might might develop some level of arousal or rehearsal of of, of that i don't know is, is there scope for that do you think no, it's, it's an interesting point. Um, I did chat to Fabian Otte a while back and I produced, I actually purchased some goalkeeping occlusion goggles and we have we have played a little bit with those in the last two years and some really rich stuff around that, I think. Um, and I know other nations have tickled with VR goggles. Um, we haven't particularly had access to that technology yet, but I know sort of Sam Vine and others have, have got projects um, to run with that sort of stuff. I think so. Um, I, we've even done that. Fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with Richard Cheatham and when he came to visit, and that's probably an important thing for coaches on the call. Like he has no clue about canoeing, and within an hour of being at our place, he'd given me some of the most profound, like, "Why do you do that?" And I'm like, "I don't know." And one of his, <laughs> his richest observations was like, "When they go down, when they start the actual event, going down the descent." Um, just thousands of information sources and decisions coming at them left, right, and center. Um, he said, from me as, a, as, a, as an independent observer, I can't see them being exposed to anywhere near that in, in the warm-up phase. Um, so we've, we've tried some crafty stuff. You'll see people like do different stuff on land, maybe whether that's like coordination type stuff, boxing, you'll see people, tennis ball type stuff, proprioception, um, and see people like, one of our athletes talks about warming their eyes up um, before they get on the water. Um, so yeah, little things around that. I think there's, yeah, there's some things I've got in the pipeline that we're, we're keen to explore, I think. I'm always open to offers, for sure. <laughs> I can just imagine, I can just imagine Richard, he would have been in his element, it would have been like a playground for him, asking questions and coming up with different ideas about things that could be explored and all that sort of stuff yeah, be... so so one example Stu, just while it comes to mind so one of the athletes at the games it was a challenge for a lot of the athletes they weren't um able because of the competition schedule access was restricted to white water for i think it was four or five days into competition now that never happens never happens like so it's a bit like, yeah, you, you know, you're not allowed on the golf course for five days into the event, but remember you, you've never played the golf course at all. You know, you don't know where the pins are going to be. There might, a green calibration might be different. Um, 
And these guys have never not paddled for five days. I mean, you try and give them time off at the end of an Olympic Games and they won't not paddle for five days. So we did some manipulations around that. We, we brought some crafty little, you know, we had Swiss balls out on the flat water. We had some occlusion in there. Um, just trying to kind of, I guess, bring the environment of the white water into some of the interactions with the flat water. Um, and yeah, I think to a, to a degree that was useful. And one of the athletes took that into their Olympic games, like preparation days when they weren't able to just, there's that sense, like, you know, they get itchy feet if they haven't been on the rough for a couple of days. Um, so there, there was a feeling that they'd somewhat calibrated that. Lovely. Um, and so you, seeing as you've taken us into the realm of golf, our, our resident golf coach has got his hand up. So Mark, come on in. Thanks, Stu. Um, great, get some um, great information. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, you've used some fabulous phrases as well. Um, one of the things that interests me and that if you can give further comment on, I'd appreciate is the idea that you can't decide you're going to wake up, how you're going to wake up on an Olympic day. And therefore that makes me wonder, like, is the training therefore about narrowing the window of variability on how you could possibly wake up? Or are we literally going down the road of you could wake up in any state whatsoever? And I guess that would then lead me to the idea of another phrase that you use quite nicely of sharing explicitly with a, uh, an athlete the idea that, well, it kind of doesn't matter how you wake up because where you get on the bus isn't important. It's where you get off, which might be the start line, if you like, or, or, or you know, going into the warm up. So I kind of just wondered how you might make sense of that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. I think... Um... A lot of it for me, and it maybe comes down to my sort of tendencies to, I'm in the job for, for, for the growth of people and the connection around that than I am for success or, or outcomes. Um, so I think it's a real encouragement that a lot of the training, the rehearsal, the simulation, whatever you might want to call it, is about being able to notice emotions or notice state, psychological state, physical state, and actually communicate that to self and team as well. Um, I mean, I've, I've certainly done it myself and I know athletes do it a lot. They, they'll kind of notice it and then maybe, you know, get attached to it. Oh, I'm not feeling that strong to go. Therefore, my, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull on the blade as much as I can. And it kind of spirals. But often when they communicate that outwardly um, across the dynamic of coach and athlete, we can make sense of it together and kind of think of experiences. Um, so it's a lot about communication to not attach to feelings because we kind of say feelings are only um, an advantage or a threat if they're attached to um, and therefore there's a lot in the psychological work that we do is about making sense of understanding your own self your awareness of self uh, and your ability to navigate that and move through it um, with your team because we are quite, quite a tight team um, Second half of your question, Mark. Sorry, remind me. Um, so it was, yeah, the idea that um, actually sharing with an athlete, it doesn't matter how you wake up um, or you know, where you get on the bus. Although there's another lovely little comment you shared. Well, I think you credited Rusty with that one. Um, but the you, you can get on the bus anywhere, but you're getting off at the same spot. Yeah, sure. So I think, I think first of all, they've got to experience that and they've got to believe that. And you have to help shape a safe environment that they can experience that over time. Uh, it's very difficult, you know. And we always have a little giggle here, you know. If, if you're paddling, you perceive yourself to be paddling poorly on the lead into a big race, it, it, it creates quite a lot of noise and there's a lot of attention placed on it. Um, but, but I always, I always have a little joke asking for their spreadsheet graph of all their pre-race performances before they go into a race and, and did that have a linear relationship to their actual performance in the event itself? Of course it doesn't. You're just getting too attached to the moments along the route and, you know, they never map that out. So it's, it's the ability to communicate that, I think, is, is an ongoing challenge for coach and athlete dynamics, um, a safe space where I think there was a question about failure in the chat that I've just noticed from Jamie, I think, um, I wouldn't ever limit failure personally. Um, 
I think in our individual sport, it's it's just trying to make, yeah, I wouldn't even like to label what failure is, but it's making sense of, of every occasion uh, and having a good strong balance of challenge and support so people can make sense of, of their own journey, I think. Really like, you know, everyone in this environment have autonomy and feel like that they can stand up. Um, you know, part of our simulations, it just reminded me, was that the coach isn't able to be there because of COVID. Now, of course, I was I was able to coach at the games, but I very nearly went home yesterday from this trip because I was in a bit of a mess with my neck. Um, so, you know, it might have played out as a delayed constraint and they've had to operate all week to the athletes without a coach, effectively on the lead into a world championships, which, which is noisy. Um, but I think some of the training we've done and their ability to notice that and how they feel about that and where to place their kind of energy and attention is, is really useful. But the ability to offload it is a massive point. So I wouldn't ever draw a line that they can't, um, they can't not like have, failure isn't an option and things like that. I'd rather just have an open line of communication because yeah, I'm definitely not perfect. It, seem, it seems to me, Craig, that well, obviously one of the principles that is often talked about and I think often misunderstood within an ecological dynamics conceptualization of coaching is the, the idea of self-organization. And it, something that's occurred to me, I don't know if I'd ever thought of before, was is this idea that you're, it seems to me that you're building self-organization into the athlete's sense of themselves and sense of preparation so that they have a, a very, very high degree of ownership of that. And, and you are there for very much a sense maker and, and have very little leadership of that. You know, so their reliance isn't, their reliance on state is, is not, placed in you it's placed in them and you're maybe there for the moment when they're like less certain shall we say is that is that an accurate reflection you think yeah i think so um kind of like this sense of like companions on a journey effectively like i don't there's no hierarchy at all um yes the journey is is in terms of their performances about them but the collective journey is about all of us um and, you know, one of the athletes we work with, he's, which is somewhat controversial, I think, maybe in some domains, is he wants the coach to be, to be his friend above all else. He wants a companion. Um, and he wants to feel part and embedded as a team because being a good person and a, a good person around people is more important to him than performing well. But it's actually a key ingredient to performing well. Um, so, yeah, and, and I'm not naive enough to think that the level that, that the athletes operate at lends to that companion role it hasn't always been that like i've worked with them two of the girls since about 16 17 i think so been through adolescence been through those development years as an athlete um for sure and obviously those development years are still continuing um so my positioning may have shifted on a continuum but i think we both all move around each other at particular times you know it's it's sensing when people are in that safe space to lead and maximizing those times, but being right with them um, through those times. But it's also, you know, being there to guide, steer um, as well. Um, but always trying to give them a sense that the journey is definitely theirs um, along the way, um, for sure. And I think, you know, some of the richest feedback I've had in coaching is, is, is more around, um, moments of transitions, key moments, how you make them feel rather than it is about, you know, I've never had anyone tell me, Craig taught me how to do this amazing skill on the water. Um, you know, if you're asked about like, uh, you know, what's, what's some of the richest memories, some of the key pivotal moments, it's often about uh, when I was considering this transition to university and I was under some pressure to move to a performance center. Um, he was here as a real sounding base, a real neutral platform. And I feel like he believed in my decision wherever I'd take it. It's those sort of moments. And that's, I guess that aligns to kind of my sense of purpose as a coach. Mm, love that. Love that. Um, I was just thinking, you, know, you did make reference to, um, to Jamie's question, but I wondered if maybe we could just delve into it in a little bit more depth. 
Jamie, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it on your behalf? Uh, go away, Stu. You can fire away, mate. <laughs> so what you've said in the chat is uh, you mentioned simulation training and how much failure do you allow within these simulations in like a percentage terms, i.e. 60% failure. Do these change depend on the stage of development? Um, or I guess in your case, because you haven't, you're working with athletes who are in adulthood in general, it maybe it's the stay the, the the period I guess of where you are in the sort of developmental cycle, whether it's a learning phase or it's a comp or pre competition phase, I guess. And how do you know if the performer has reached optimal failure without impairing on performance? So, what's your focus? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jamie. Great, great question. Um, and I'm just kind of musing over whether that's quite specific to individual and team sports, but but yeah, we'll we can we can interact around that if need be. Um, I think they write their own permissions for failure, to be honest, is where we're at. Um, whatever failure may mean um, in our sport, yeah, you, you can't hang your hat on a certain level of performance. Definitely there's aspirational kind of targets for sure, um, but winning is, is winning for you in whatever your success was on that day. In terms of the simulations, which is the specific question, um, so they often wrote their own conditions and own their own conditions for, say, progression in the rounds. So if you imagine we're mimicking the Olympic program where there's qualification into a semifinal, semifinal into a final, um, they will have written their own performance levels that they have to hit that if they, in inverted commas, fail to hit, then they have given themselves accountability that they will not go on the start line in the afternoon and they will have to watch their peers race in the afternoon. So... I guess in terms of that, there's, there's conditions within the simulations that dictate um, failure or success to a degree. Um, but we would always debrief thoroughly around a generally positive lens you know, or how we were responding to some challenges. I mean, obviously, the intention of disruption is that it disrupts something and there's a reaction. Um, otherwise, you know, everyone's operating like a Zen, Zen Buddha out there, and that, that's not reality. Um, so my focus is really, I guess, on, on supporting their intentions and helping them guide their attention into places that are conducive with their intentions. Um, and uh, me having a deep understanding of that so I can help anchor reflection and review and not let it go too broad and too deep and too wandering into what can be in some of those sessions like real self-damning feedback. Um, that's why it's quite a collaborative process and, and really rich in terms of periods of time we focus on in other periods of time. So I was chatting to Marianne about this the other day. I somewhat experimentally used um, Fabian Otte and Keith David's framework. Uh, I think there might be other authors on that. I apologize for not naming them. The um, post framework um, of skills training. Um, might have, I said to Marianne, I maybe butchered it. Um, a little bit in that we use that actually for the, the lead-in training to Tokyo on an individual level. But rather than looking at it at the, the development or um, adaptation of skill from, say, beginning a skill to executing a high performance in a skill, we looked at it in terms of how we, how we took up with the venue itself in Japan. Um, and that, that gave us the permissions, Jamie, I guess, in terms of where the focus was, both for them and me as a coach through each block. So, um, you know, a coordination phase, um, an exploitation phase and a performing stage. Um, I can't remember it in a, in a perfect citation right now, but that was kind of how we framed like the three key blocks of time in Tokyo. And within that, I guess the representation of slalom was dialed up for the race and the permissions around, I guess, what they would perceive as success or failure through those blocks were guided around those. So that's probably a good example. Um, very much a co-created platform, I would say, Jamie, in terms of permissions of focus and permissions of what accountability to performance people are placing on themselves in, in any given period of training. Thanks, uh, Craig. Really appreciate your uh, input there. Thanks, Ben. Um, Craig, on that on that subject, um, you, you just when you just referred to the, the post training framework, what what does that refer to specifically? Is that a an acronym? 
Yeah, it is. Sorry, it's the periodization of skills training by uh, uh, Ariane. Can correct me if I'm not citing correctly here, but it's Fabian Otte and Keith Davids. May well be one or two other authors on. Maybe Marianne can throw it in the chat. And um, if I've not cited that correctly, um, and it's an ecological lens of, I guess, um, periodization of skills training framework, um, kind of in line with ecological dynamics. So I moment I saw it as a visual um, it got me thinking about how we approach um, what we might call um, attuning or discovering a new venue in a constrained framework of time um, so we had planned I had this beauty <laughs> you'll laugh at this I had this beautiful Mount Everest analogy for um, six training camps we had in Tokyo games and um, the six key general base camps if you do the particular route of Everest, which is the, the infrequently climbed one. And obviously we ended up only going like once or twice. So um, yeah, when I saw that, I saw an opportunity to potentially butcher it. I might have to talk to Fabian and hope I, hopefully I haven't. Um, but in terms of it made sense to me of actually just periodizing training within a certain block and giving permissions that what we didn't want to do was just have four weeks building up or counting down to this big moment in time. We wanted actually to theme very carefully and give permissions um, for some key training blocks around, like, are, we, are we still developing and exploring here? Um, we're doing a high amount of variability, for example, um, in differing levels of representation. Um, then we might, yeah, kind of dial up and dial down on some of those um, factors as we go closer to racing. I've seen, um, I've seen Danny Newcomb use a triangle of exploring, exploiting, and executing, um, which I think is sounds to me is something similar. And so blocking in, not necessarily blocking in that way, but, and it sounds to me as well, like you cycled through those. So it was almost like there were some peaks, you know, because executing obviously has a different dynamic to it. So it sounds to me like in the executing phase, that's where one of the athlete accountabilities would be if they don't, achieve whatever it is they've set out to achieve they don't they don't then race in the, the second you know they, they, they haven't made it to the equivalent of the semi-final or they haven't qualified so to speak so that strikes me as being something that you would be doing in a simulated execution phase but you wouldn't be doing that in the exploration phase because if you were to do something like that in exploration you're not going to get much exploration are you so i guess is that how you were thinking about it cycling it through yeah absolutely and i think it gives it, for, for us, it give, gives anchors of reference at uh, what is a very a time of potential heightened emotion, heightened adrenaline, heightened anxiety towards, I guess, uh, one of the biggest moments in their sport in life. So I'll give you an example. Like in the first phase, we gave permission for variability to be very high between us. Now, the challenge to that is that athletes like to be consistent. And if, if they're not achieving a stable outcome, and you're moving on and challenge them with different different challenges quite regularly then there's that if you haven't kind of laid out a framework of periodization where you say in this next phase we will have the opportunity to reflect back if there's any particular sequences we want to go and look at um, it could have got very noisy in there and you just start thinking i'm paddling insert expletive um, at the moment i can't do this stuff um, and what you might see traditionally in that block maybe is, is that athletes spend a lot of time trying to master one sequence. And of course, that sequence may or may not feature in the race at all. Yeah. And, but what they miss is the ability to explore and really, um, really journey through the whole landscape. Um, and that's where you start to kind of pick up on the small little haptic stuff. And like you've talked about before, you know, what, what different water features feel like under your bum through the paddle, um, all those little different aspects. Um, you will see, um, yeah, lots of different approaches to training in environments. It's fascinating. If you ever get to go to one of your competitions and not coach, really recommend it. Just actually observe. And you see things very differently because you're not caught up in your own hamster wheel of, of trying to be good. 
that's one of the benefits I've often found of being a coach developer, you get to watch other coaches coach and you see it from an entirely different perspective and pick up loads of things. I've actually picked up loads of ideas, uh, you know, from watching other people in action, both good and bad, you know, lots of lots of different uh, things. Um, and just to raise that point around that kind of model around exploration, execution, exploitation, um, what people may or may not realize is, is it's, it's actually a very useful framework for practice design um, and even within session. So some coaches, for example, might have a group for once a week and therefore wouldn't necessarily be able to have a block, a training block leading up to an event because they're kind of weekly coaches playing in a kind of league format week to week. But you can do explore, exploit, execute within one session. You know, you can have periods of exploration, periods where you're going to refine down to having identified, having learned something within our exploration phase. We're now going to refine to a few of the things that we've discovered and we're going to do more of those. And then at the end, we're going to task ourselves to really be, be able to sort of apply some of these constructs that we've sort of discovered through our exploratory phase. It's, nice, it's a nice framework and lens through which to look at the way we can we can develop practice within the session as well as over a period of time. Absolutely. And I'm laughing at myself here, Stu, because <laughs> I used to hate models and frameworks. <laughs> I really did. Like, I would steer clearer than that. Like, yeah, it's definitely just an artistry and a base coach when I started. Um, and I've probably kind of had a tug of war around the middle of the balance of art and science um, for a while now. Um, but yeah, I guess you just explore different things at different times and you see what it gives you and gives, gives the people you work with. Um, and I think that particular one at that particular time settled well as a group um, and we were able to really individualize it. I guess um, yeah, I don't envy the challenge of some of your guys on the call working with yeah, multiple numbers of um, very high energy youngsters um, and maybe only seeing them once a week. Um, I think it presents an interesting challenge and one of yeah always enjoy exploring actually well um g given that you're um you're you're due to um given that you're due to sort of get up early and you're ahead you're an hour ahead of us so i want to be very very respectful of your time craig but i'm just wondering if there's maybe one more question from anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet who wants to come in let me just see if there's anything there no, I'm going to take that as a no. At which point, uh, my my thanks, Craig, for taking time out of your what will be a very busy time for you to share your reflections on your time at the games and both in the run up and during in what was a unique situation, uh, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and you know, my thanks on behalf of the group as well. Um, you know, you've been more than candid with your reflections. And, you know, I think, as always, one of the things that really comes across uh, whenever I talk to you is just how thoughtful, you know, you are about this and how earnestly committed to the kind of interaction between coach and athlete being one of, you know, genuine kind of uh, um, engagement and one of Kind of a, a genuine connection on the human level and very much wanting or working very very hard I think against probably some you know different different pressures to just place them at the heart of the learning develop the learning and the development and the performance space which is which is always in my opinion so admirable and also really fascinating um just um I mean it'd be interesting just to get kind of your perspectives around um uh Kind of where next, really? I know you've got uh, a, an impending competition, and then probably a little bit of our, uh, well well deserved R and R. Uh, but you know what, what's next on the agenda for you? And uh, if anybody is curious to maybe reach out, I know you're uh, very uh, overly generous, I'd say, with your time, as is as evidenced tonight. So, uh, what, what's the what's next, and how can people reach out? Yeah, thanks, Stu. Yeah, so last race of the season for us, one more week to go. Um, and then returning to the UK, um, yeah, a little bit of R&R, &R, catch up with my daughters who are screaming at me to come home. Lots of coaches on the call will know that, that <laughs> feeling when you're away on the road. Um, 
yeah, a little few activities, hoping to get up to the Heroes Awards for UK coaching in a couple of weeks as well. Um, and then, yeah, um, being kindly enough asked to do a few engagements at conferences through, through speaking through the winter and things. So, yeah, looking to kind of just have a little bit of time gathering my thoughts, coming up with some new new threads to pull on for us as a group and a programme through towards Paris, which will come around very quickly. Um, and yeah, trying to keep my engagement in, in expanding into broader challenges of coach development, I think, and mentoring um, throughout that space and time as well. So yeah, if anyone wants just to catch me, I'm, I'm not quite as um, rife as Stu on Twitter, but I'm not far behind these days. Um, so I'm on there as uh, Morris Craig underscore, um, and you can grab me on LinkedIn at Craig Morris as well. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your time again, Stu. Delighted to, to be able to reflect and certainly lots for me to chew on as I head to bed here in Slovakia. Uh, well, as I said earlier, really appreciate it. Thank you ever so much and uh, all the best with, uh, with the, the competitions going ahead in the next few days. Thank you. Take care, everyone.